Hello and welcome to this week's Wildlife Matters podcast. I'm your host, Nigel Palmer. And we have another exciting show for you this week. It's been a really busy time here at Wildlife Matters HQ. This week's main feature will be our trip to the Upland Moors and the shutting down of grouse shoots on the opening day of their season. Then, in complete contrast, join me in a stunning ancient woodland in Kent as we sit beside a small crystal clear stream to enjoy some time in nature in this week's Wildlife Matters Mindful Moments. And how many of you watched Sir Brian May's documentary on badgers and bovine TB last Friday? We were genuinely impressed with Brian and Anne Brummer's work over the years. What they showed us will help end the badger cult. And stay tuned for our full story on this, along with our visit to the National Animal Rights March in London, and a new report on wildlife crime in this week's Wildlife Matters Nature News that is coming up next on the Wildlife Matters podcast. Hello and welcome to this week's Wildlife Matters and Nature News. Last Friday night, Wildlife Matters gathered with friends and fellow advocates to watch Sir Brian May's BBC documentary, The Badgers, The Farmers and Me. The documentary, which I'm told is four years in the making, follows Brian May and Anne Brummer on their pilgrimage to cattle farms in search of a solution to bovine TB without killing badgers. Working with farmer Robert Reed and veterinarian Dick Sibley at Reed's Gatcom Farm, which had been under restriction for a number of years for bovine TB, they concluded that the badger cull, resulting in the slaughter of hundreds of thousands of badgers, was based on flawed science. Sibley's system of identifying bovine TB early using the latest technology rather than the century-old testing that DEFRA was insisting farmers use in their research indicates that managing bovine TB within a herd is possible without culling badgers. The documentary illuminates the government's failure to address bovine TB and listen to scientific evidence. The government's seemingly politically motivated decisions to ignore the scientific fact and continue with an ineffective and horribly expensive policy of killing badgers has had a devastating effect and negative consequences of course for badgers but also for cattle and for the farmers who have lost their livelihoods due to TB restrictions and despite the culling of thousands of badgers. Wildlife Matters has huge respect for the courage and dedication of Brian May and Anne Brummer, who spoke out and then dedicated so much time and energy to prove that the government was making poor decisions that were costing the lives of innocent badgers and cattle and destroying farmers' livelihoods. It's a gritty and at times challenging watch that we believe has blown the lid off the existing badger culling policy and will change the intensive farming practices in the UK and far beyond. Take a bow, Sir Brian, and the irrepressible Anne Brummer for standing up to the powerful government machine and proving them wrong and vitally for us for saving the lives of thousands of badgers by showing us the evidence that bovine TB is in the herd and not in the clan. 
Our second story this week is about the National Animal Rights March, where nearly 3,000 animal-loving activists marched through the streets of London on Saturday, August 17th. For the National Animal Rights March, an annual event that highlights animal suffering and deaths caused by humans. The central theme for this year's march was Animal Rights, Not Welfare, which communicates the message that animals are here with us and not for us. Animals deserve to be treated with compassion and respect. They are not our property and we should never treat them as such. According to one of the marchers that Wildlife Matters spoke to, who told us we won't be satisfied with comfier cages. We demand empty ones. We don't want tests to be conducted on animals. We are demanding the end of animal testing. We want the end of using animals for any purpose, to benefit humans solely whatsoever. Wildlife Matters was among the thousands of individuals, charities and groups marching to liberate animals and create systemic change to end animal exploitation whilst promoting a cruelty-free vegan lifestyle. The grassroots event provided advocates the perfect opportunity to publicly demonstrate solidarity while fighting for a better world for all animals. Thousands of spectators shopping, dining and riding double-decker buses and black cabs along busy London streets witnessed the marches, which started in Marble Arch and travelled through Oxford Circus, Piccadilly Circus and then on to Whitehall. The march included stops at the retailer Canada Goose and two famous London steakhouses where at least one activist was handcuffed by police during a spontaneous protest. The the march ended at Parliament Square, where speeches were taken from a podium under unusually sunny skies. The speakers included Kat Chan, the wonderful Lynn Sawyer, Andy Atkinson, Leila Dayagan, Louise Ryan and Dr Roger Yates. Our third story on this week's Wildlife Matters Nature News is the publishing of a report by I4, the International Fund for Animal Welfare, into wildlife crime in the UK, which highlights the challenges of prosecuting wildlife crime, such as harming badgers, foxes and birds of prey. The report reveals that only 6 to 14% of reported wildlife crimes in Scotland, which is the only country in the UK that releases data on wildlife crime, actually lead to prosecution. At the same time, and despite an increase in reported wildlife crime incidents, prosecutions in England and Wales have dropped by 40%. The report identifies various obstacles to prosecuting wildlife crimes, including a lack of resources, inconsistent legislation and difficulties in gathering evidence. It also notes breakdowns in communication between enforcement agencies and threats to rural communities and expert witnesses. Public support for action against wildlife criminals is high. A YouGov survey showed that nearly two-thirds of the respondents believe that the illegal killing of wild animals should carry a prison sentence. Additionally, there is a widespread support for the government to do more to investigate and prosecute wildlife crimes. The report calls on the government to make a wildlife crime a notifiable offence, establish a central database for recording wildlife crimes, provide mandatory legal training and ensure ring-fenced funding for the National Crime Unit. These measures, supported by Wildlife Matters, aim to enhance the prosecution of wildlife crimes and to protect more wild animals. 
And that has been this week's Wildlife Matters Nature News. On this week's Wildlife Matters Mindful Moments, it's set in a stunning ancient woodland in Kent. As you join us, it's nearing the end of another long day and we have just found a fast running stream with crystal clear waters. As we sit on the mossy bank and cup our hands to drink the cool water, After quenching my thirst, I remove my walking boots and socks and slowly submerge my feet into the water. Can you feel that cold, soothing water washing away the day's stresses and strains? Now, relax and enjoy this week's Wildlife Matters Mindful Moments. Listening to that stream brought back memories of that wonderful day in Kent, walking up and down the high weald and exploring some of the many woodlands in the valleys and just how good it felt to cool down in the crystal clear fresh water after walking around 10 miles that day. Another idyllic day spent in nature is just the perfect audio memory and I've enjoyed sharing it with you on this week's Wildlife Matters Mindful Moments. Hello and welcome to this week's Wildlife Matters main feature. The red grouse shooting season begins in August each year on what the shooters call the Glorious Twelfth. Of course, there is nothing glorious in the mass slaughter of wild birds. Wildlife has long opposed grouse shoots and has previously detailed why we oppose driven grouse shooting. In addition to the mindless slaughter of the birds and the inaccuracy of some of the shooters, which means long, slow and painful death for the birds, we have revealed how our government is subsidising the shooting industry. The funding should be used to maintain and restore the upland moors, not to create a heather and grouse monoculture, and then there is the burning of the old heather. The environmental damage from the intensive burning not only ignites the peat, which can burn underground for weeks, but also releases carbon previously stored by the peat back into the environment, which accelerates global warming. 
The burnt and scorched peat bogs can then no longer absorb rainwater, which runs off the upland hills and floods the nearby towns and villages. And we could go on. But let's focus on why Wildlife Matters has travelled to the North Yorkshire Moors. It's mid-August and Wildlife Matters has arrived in a remote lay-by, deep in the upland moors of North Yorkshire. It is a bright and warm morning, but dark clouds are approaching. From this point, we can see Yorkshire's big skies and vast open landscape, which means I think I can see for maybe a 100 miles or more. For those who may not know, red grouse are physically smaller than pheasants, but larger than partridges, which they resemble. The grouse are naturally found in groups known as coveys, which can contain as many as 20 birds all living together. Coveys can be smaller, but rarely are they larger. Grouse are hardy birds that live in exposed moorlands in cold and windy conditions. They feed primarily on heather shoots and inhabit bleak moorland. Grouse can fly within a week of hatching. Despite endemic disease on most moors, they are one of the most robust flying birds. Technically, the grouse are not artificially reared. Instead, their populations are kept deliberately high by the keepers who actively trap, poison and kill any predator or potential predator of grouse. The heather is regularly burned to encourage new growth and the heather tips or shoots provide food to the grouse that live on the moor. At these population levels, disease amongst the grouse is endemic and the keepers will put tons of medicated grit in small containers in many, many locations across the moor. It's the keepers' work to maintain the artificially high population of grouse and remove the predators that naturally call the moors home. And the estate owners are interested in the money. Not just the money they get from the shooting parties, but the money that they get from the government in the form of grants and subsidies that are meant to maintain our natural habitat of the upland moors and not to create a heather-based monoculture for grouse alone with a landscape full of lead shot and the dead and decaying bodies of the shot grouse that were never collected. Wildlife Matters Investigates is here to observe how grouse shoots work and, most importantly, how the hunt sabs effectively stop the shoots. Grouse shoots operate two different methods of shoots known as walking up and driven shoots. Driven shooting is uniquely British method, where a long line of beaters, often coming from several miles away, will drive vast flocks of grouse towards the waiting guns. The guns are stationed in shooting butts that are shoulder-high brick or timber walls that run in a line across the moor. There can be multiple lines of butts across a single moor and the birds will be driven towards specific lines of shooters throughout the day. The walking up method differs because the guns or shooters will form a line across the moor. With their many and various dogs to disturb the birds, they will walk into the wind and shoot anything that they have flushed from cover. The walking up method is mainly used later on in the season when the numbers of grouse have been depleted by the driven shooting or on moors where the grouse are in short supply. So how do you know when a shoot occurs if you don't belong to a shooting club? Well, if you live locally to a shooting moor, you will know that they place so-called adverts on the footpaths that access the moors. These are often A4 laminated sheets pinned to notice boards or footpath signs that are essentially telling you that the moor is closed today for the shooting. You can contact national parks who will supply, on request, a list of dates when the moors are closed for shoots. 
and the shoots must also notify the national parks to close the moors on these allocated days. Councils can also supply a list of footpaths or moors that will be closed for shooting, but again this is on request. Of course, things are not that straightforward and in reality as most of the shooting estates are privately owned and they have no obligation to inform the public of shooting days as they take place on private land. Having arrived nearly three hours early in advance of the start of the shooting day, it was clear that the shooters were not very keen to walk along the same footpaths and rough muddy tracks that the keepers and the sabs were using. But instead, they gathered in groups, clad in their tweed outfits with their gun cases slung over their backs. That's not very inconspicuous, whilst you're standing at the side of a road, with their tailored tweed outfits, caps and hunter boots, all still immaculately clean. As with many things in life, planning is vital to a successful outcome. And I'm very fortunate to be working today with someone who knows the moor and its multiple entrances and line of shooting butts very well indeed. I do have some previous experience stopping fox hunts and badger cull shooters, but grouse shoots are different. Firstly, there are a lot more boots needed on the ground. There are so many footpaths and access ways to the moor, and this moor has six lines of shooting butts which all need to be watched, and these cover an area of around 50 square miles. I'm in the back of a van with two coordinators who have OS maps open. The maps show the location of the six separate lines of shooting butts and the monitors are in place across the moor watching the entrance paths to the moors and looking out for the beating party or where a disparate range of vehicles are all converging on a remote lay-by location at the same time. My experienced colleagues, now friends, have radio comms with a range of people I have yet to meet, but who have travelled from all around the North and Midlands to be here today. I have been tasked with radio comms and am soon busy giving coordinates and instructions when the call comes in from one of our scouting groups, which has spotted what they believe is the beating party. They watch from a distance and are soon able to confirm that they are the beaters and now our coordinators know which line of shooting butts will be used today. I was told to contact the more base groups and give them the location and they all acknowledged and headed for the grid reference I had given them. Within minutes there was an army of around 80 to 100 SABs in place and a thin line began spreading out across the moor. The SABs were forming a pre-beating line well in advance of the shoot's beaters and began to drive the birds away from the shooting butts. It's impressive to see a line of SABs arrow straight, waving white flags and making a right racket, sending clouds of grouse and other birds high into the air and onto another part of the moor where they would be safe. They carried out two passes before the shoot beaters had even arrived. I was so impressed and in total awe of these guys and gals and their fantastic work to save wildlife. The shooter's beating party was forming around a mile from the shooting butts and began to assemble themselves into some wiggly wobbly line that really should have been dead straight. What I saw next reminded me more of sabbing a hare hunt. The sabs were counter-beating and forming into two groups, flanking the shoot beaters. If you think of a single line drawing of an arrowhead, with the shoot beaters being the bottom line, and the two groups of sabs working towards them from each side. Our driver moved into a new place where we can see the shoots beaters being escorted by the two lines of sab. In solidarity, they march in the direction of the shooters in their shooting butts. As the shoot beaters and the sabs approach the waiting guns, we can all see the shooters are there in position and ready. The sabs tactics now allow the shoot beaters to come through. 
to reuse my earlier visual pictogram of an arrowhead being turned around so now the shoot beaters were the top line and these sabs were peeking off from the front and forming a line in front of the shooting butts. This well-coordinated manoeuvre, with sabs lined up in front of the shooting butts, perhaps 50 metres or so away, and waving their white flags and making a lot of noise. Whilst risky for the individual, sab presence will make any grouse driven by the shoot's beaters fly higher into the air and above the line of guns and, again, to the relative safety of the far side of the shooting butt. I can now see that some of the sabs had got to both sides of the walls of the shooting butts, stopping the guns from turning round to shoot towards the escaping grouse. The paying guns were now unable to shoot towards the grouse, driven by their beaters as they had a line of sabs on the moor, driving the birds high into the air and another line now standing on the front wall of the shooting butts. We watched. The shoot manager call his beaters in as two Land Rovers quickly sped towards the butts to take those paying shooters away. I heard the shoot manager shout that the shoot was over for the day. Success. Tempers were frayed and emotions were running high amongst the tweed outfits who had probably paid a thousand pound or more each to be at today's shoot which never happened. It may have been the end of their day, but not for us. Having packed up this shoot so much earlier than anyone had expected, we were already in contact with another group of SABs working on another moor around 20 miles away. And so we joined the line of vehicles, leaving the various laybys and acts Vintage landy defenders to an eclectic mix of older 4x4s and more than a few everyday cars. They were all full of wonderful folk who have travelled to North Yorkshire to stop the shoot for the day. And a massive shout out to each of these groups that I met on the day that came from Sheffield, Leeds, Liverpool, Manchester, Hull and a very special mention to the Brummies from near Warsaw. And that has been this week's Wildlife Matters main feature. We hope you enjoyed discovering how the shoots were once again shut down on their opening day meet. Of course, this vital work continues until December. The driven grouse shooting industry is undoubtedly nearing its end now. The frenzied shooting of grouse, the leg cartridge shells scattered across the moorland and the vast subsidies the government gives the estates to restore nature and wildlife that are being used to develop a monoculture of heather and grouse bred to be shot. And don't believe that they eat what they shoot. They kill thousands of birds a day and cannot even give them away as they are full of poisonous lead. Tragically, the grouse end up in deep holes in the ground which will only be covered once they are completely full. Now, a huge thank you to all of you who have ordered from the new Wildlife Matters shop. There has been an early sellout on the tote bags and the Badger and Fox t-shirts are clearly very popular. If you haven't seen the shop yet, come and have a browse around. Just search for Wildlife Matters shop or click the link in the show notes below. We've also given the Wildlife Matters podcast its very own little website. Of course, it will always be available on our main website, but we hope more people who don't have access to the paid podcast platforms can now listen to us. You can find us on PodPage or by searching for it as PodPage a Wildlife Matters a podcast, and we will leave a link in the show notes. So all that is left for me to do is thank you for listening. We hope you enjoyed our return to direct but completely legal action. 
Wildlife Matters will return in two weeks' time with the penultimate episode of season four. Wow. But for now, I've been your host, Nigel Palmer, and this is Wildlife Matters, a signing off.